We're going to return today to John chapter 13, so if you turn in your Bibles to that, John chapter 13. Uh, Once again, we're going to cover uh, verses 1 through 20. Uh, Last week, we sort of just got into the introduction of this chapter in verses 1 through 5, and we'll uh, attempt to go through the rest of that particular section of Scripture today. So if you would please stand as we read this portion of God's Word. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and, taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but after your word you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who is bathed does not need to be to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to portray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I am not speaking of all of you. I know who I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I am telling you this now for before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. May God bless his word. You may be seated. So we began this particular chapter last week uh, discussing that right before Jesus' betrayal, his forsaking by the apostles and his crucifixion and his death and his resurrection that he gives them this example. It is an example that he gives. And so this is right about as we see here is the feast of the Passover time. We reviewed last week what the Passover stood for, that the Passover was the memorial, basically the observance, remembering God's deliverance of the children of Israel from Egyptian bondage, how that that Passover feast required the death of a lamb without spot, without blemish, that blood had to be applied upon the doorpost of the house for God to pass over that house and for there not to be death to come to that house. And so there was deliverance for the children of Israel because of that, and it was observed yearly. And as I said last week, as the Uh, Lord's Supper was going to be observed by Jesus and the apostles. This was really the last, what we would call legitimate, biblical Passover. The Passover has no efficacy, we said. There's no efficacy to the Passover. There's no, uh, nothing that is benefited by observing the Passover. Uh, It is a shadow. It is a shadow of what Christ did. And once the 
once the fulfillment of the shadow has been fulfilled, then there's no use going back to the shadow. Uh, as the law, there's not a use in going back to the law once the fulfillment of the law through the Lord Jesus Christ has been accomplished. He, he fulfilled all the requirements of the law. And he is, as we said last week, the Lamb of God who brings in a new covenant. And we talked about some of those things. Not going to go back into all of that, but we have the scene here before us. Now, it was not unusual, as we said last week, for there to be a servant or someone that would come in in a home. If you had visitors, travelers that came to your home, and your feet would be dirty, as I said last week, that they would have, they wore sandals in those days. They didn't wear uh, high heeled shoes or uh, or boots or tennis shoes or anything of that matter and their, and their feet would be dirty from the travels and so very often there would be the foot washing but in this particular point in time there's no one designated for that and Jesus' purpose in this was to reveal this servant mentality that all of us as believers are to have it is an illustration of Philippians 2 and 7 which says he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Jesus' condescension to come from heaven is servanthood, but here he is giving to the disciples a visible manifestation of how they should treat one another and all believers in the church and in the family of God in this. And he had tried to teach these lessons before, as we've talked about. And they had missed the lessons. And so Jesus demonstrates to them what this servanthood should look like. And so we find that Jesus is coming around and he's washing the disciples' feet. And he's wiping them with this towel that is wrapped around him. And he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Now, do we don't have any record of any of the other apostles asking Jesus or making any comment when Jesus came to them. Now we might conjecture as to why that Peter asked this question, and I think we get some insight into that in the later verses. The question becomes, is he ashamed of not thinking of doing this himself? Or is he taking offense at Jesus as coming and washing his feet? Does he think that he somehow says, oh, well you're not going to wash my feet as we look at this because somehow that makes me better than the other apostles. They, they let you wash their feet, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, we don't know specifically really in the mind, but we get some insights into that. And so what Jesus replies to him in this conversation is what I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Now, as, many, as much truth as had been revealed to the apostles, they were still dull in some of their spiritual understanding. They still had not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit that came upon the day of Pentecost. And so they were still dull in many respects in regards to understanding the truth that Jesus was trying to teach them. In particular, in one passage in Matthew chapter 15, and there in verses 15 and 16, and Jesus is speaking to them and, and talking about what defiles a person. And, and the disciples come to him in verse 12 and said, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? Well, the Pharisees were offended at everything that Jesus said, <laughs> particularly. And he answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone. They are blind guides. If the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. In other words, he says, let them be offended. Jesus was not afraid, really, of offense. And the Peter, but Peter said to him, explain the parable to us. And Jesus said, are you also still with not, without understanding? And so then he explains the teaching there to them. But there were dull in their understanding. And if you even remember when he walked after his resurrection on the Emmaus Road uh, there uh, in Luke chapter 24. And there in verse 25, and he walked there as it says there. 
uh, in verse 24, it says, Some of those who were with us went to the tomb. This was after the resurrection and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. There was still this dullness to their understanding there. And so, but Jesus, if you notice in this, is very patient with Peter in his reply here. It's one of the things that I noticed as I studied this. He was trying to teach them concerning, he was trying to teach them concerning his role in his first coming. You see, I think there was still somewhat of that thought. He's the Messiah. He's going to come back. He's going to come in triumph. He's going to rule Israel at this particular time. He's going to bring the kingdom into play here. We're going to be delivered from the Romans, and he's going to restore Israel to its former glory. They still did not completely understand what Jesus was doing at this particular point in time. And, but also, they did not understand, and he was revealing this to them, that he came not to be the king of men at that particular point in time as far as a literal ruling in Israel, but he came to be a servant and to deliver them from eternal death. In another passage in, in Matthew, there in chapter 20, and there in verses 26 through 28, Jesus again talking here about his purpose in coming. What does he say? As he says here, but Jesus called to them and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. In that verse, he is giving them really both aspects or perspectives of the purpose for which he came. I didn't come to be served. I came to serve and I came to give my life as a ransom for many. And he's still trying to teach them that lesson, I believe, in this particular passage of Scripture is what he is trying to teach. And so we see that. And so this is the lesson that he sought to teach them. So we move on down here to verse 8. And so when he says here, he says, You do not understand what I'm doing. And Peter said, Okay, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Now, I think what we see here is some pride and some arrogance in the apostle Peter. Oh, you're never going to wash my feet. Jesus, I'm not going to let you do this. But basically what he says here is, is, he was, is he's missing the point again. He's missing the point of the lesson that Jesus is trying to teach. And Jesus very patiently answers the apostle Peter. He doesn't rebuke him. But he says, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Listen to what I have to say, Peter. And then Peter, not, still not really understanding Tells Jesus, oh, well, wash my hands and my head also, Jesus. <laughs> Thinking that Jesus is speaking here really of, of, of physical cleansing. This is, this is not it. <laughs> this is not it. But we need to understand some, sometimes, and sometimes we look at these things and we think, oh, how dull of hearing that they were and how, you know, that really was ignorant. Uh, you think, you know, let's back up here and think about the things that we have been ignorant of in regards to the scripture throughout our lives. In reality, they were still just very early believers in this. There are many of the truths that we take for granted that have been here sitting under expository preaching and teaching for all of these years and sitting under grace teaching and listening to a lot of good preachers on, on the internet and in person perhaps, and we understand these things. And we think, well, how can people not understand this? But sometimes it takes time. It takes the illumination of the Spirit of God to teach them these things. And so this is Jesus being patient here. And what Jesus speaks of here, look, what it, look at what he says here. Jesus says, the one who has bathed does not need to wash. And, under, and, and in the Greek, there's two different words here for the bathe and the washing. The bathe speaks more of a complete walk, bathing of the body. The washing has to do with parts of the body, like washing your hands or washing your feet. 
But he said, he said, the one who bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean, and you're clean, but not every one of you. Now, what is Jesus speaking of here? What Jesus is speaking of here is not about physical cleansing. He is talking about spiritual cleansing. He is talking about the washing away of sin. He is talking about salvation. That once there is that complete bathing, so to speak, once there is that complete bathing away of our sins, there is not any need to have that again. Uh, and so, but there is what he's saying here when he says, he says, you, you must have this cleansing from me. He's saying surely that there is no cleansing and there is no washing away of sin apart from Christ. And even the, the Old Testament scripture speaks about this necessity of the washing away of sin. In Zechariah 13 and verse 1, it is, uh, prophetically speaking, on that day... There shall be a fountain opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them, what? From sin and uncleanness. He is teaching here for you to be clean, for you to be washed from your sin, I must cleanse you. I must wash you, metaphorically speaking. He's giving a word picture here in this. And we see in 1 Corinthians 6 and 11 what it says there. And such were some of you, speaking of those that had lived in the works of the flesh, in immorality and drunkenness and all lying and all of these things. And he says, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. This is what he's talking about here. This is what Jesus is speaking about. And when you look at the, at the tenses of this, and some of the, as you get to studying in the Greek, verses 10 and 11 really uh, explain and validate this application of salvation. And in those verses, when it talks about the one who is bathed, when it speaks there, it's using a tense that is known as the perfect participle. A per perfect participle is used when, when to say, when it's saying here is washed, is stressing the state brought about by the finished results of the action. The action is finished. The cleansing, this complete bathing away and washing away of sins has been completed. But when he talks there about the washing of the feet, it's a different tense. He's talking there about perhaps daily cleansing from the world. Walking through the world, bathing the feet of the filth of the world, of the sin of the world, and confessing your sins. So the completely clean speaks of this one-time cleansing from sin. And there's not another need for that. There's no other need for another cleansing of the body. And that's why, you know, we baptize by immersion because it's a picture of that complete immersion into Christ and that washing away of sin. There's no more need for that. There's no more need for, for that kind of thing. We, there are denominations that teach you can lose your salvation and then you have to, be, have to go through the whole thing again. No, if you've ever been truly cleansed of your sins, you got it all the first time. But there is this need, metaphorically speaking, again, for the washing of the feet. Therefore, the reading that we had this morning in 1 John chapter 1, uh, what we have to say there about the confession of sin. Let me ask the question, since you've been saved, have you sinned? I can answer that question for you. Yes. <laughs> yes. And so what do we do for that? As we go through this world, we're going to be tempted. Sometimes we're going to yield a temptation. We're going to buy just to have sin that, that in the thought process sometimes that comes, and we need to confess those sins. And so what John says here, if we say we got no sin, you're not telling the truth. You're a liar. But he says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us to our sins. And so there's that restoration there, that, that cleansing that occurs there, that practical sanctification. I think a great example of that is not in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament in David. In David, who was a man after God's own heart, 
Of course, we know the story of he and Bathsheba. And then in Psalm 51, after he's confronted by the prophet, what does he do? He confesses his sins to God. And he begins off, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. This is what we pray for. He says, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions. And my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. So what? David was wanting there was not a restoration to being a man after God's own heart. He was still a man of God. He still knew the Lord, but he needed restoration. He needed cleansing from that sin, and we need that. Uh, and, and we should do that. I, I, I've said this before, that every one of us, when we pray daily, you know, we, if you've forgotten about it, when you lay your pillow, head on the pillow at night, confess, Lord, I, I've, committed some, I've committed sin today. Please forgive me of those sins that I've committed. And if you know specifically what they are, then you should name them, what that sin is that you should confess. But the cleansing of the feet here represents that daily cleansing that we need and that, that need to, to continue our walk and our, our, uh, our fellowship with the Lord daily. And so when he, and then he says here, but not every one of you are clean, Peter, but not every one of you, of course, there, he is speaking of Judas Iscariot, who was, of course, that one that would betray the Lord Jesus Christ. Now moving on here to verse 12, and it says that he knew who was to betray him. Of course he knew who was to betray him. It was prophesied there in the Old Testament. But it says, not all of you, that's what he meant by not all of you are clean. But in verse 12, what did he say? When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them. And here he really begins this teaching concerning to tell them, here is what this means. He says, do you understand what I have done to you? Now we don't see that there's a reply here from anybody. I'm surprised that we don't have a, a, a reply by the Apostle Peter. The Apostle Peter must have really not known what it meant because he was, he was very apt to speak up, even when he didn't know what he was talking about and that's a good rule of thumb if you don't know what you're talking about don't say anything <laughs> but he says here do you understand what I've done you call me teacher and Lord and you're right for so I am he acknowledges their acceptance of him as teacher and Lord uh, some of the versions use the word master and that's an appropriate word to use in this place uh, it is a term of respect that was given to Jewish scribes and truly the Lord Jesus Christ had demonstrated his authority and his mastery over the scriptures. You remember what Nicodemus said when he came to him uh, by night there in John chapter 3 and there in verse 2 it says, This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, Rabboni, we know that you are a teacher come from God for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. He acknowledged that he was a great teacher, a great master. And then in Matthew chapter 7, uh, uh, in verses 28 and 29, the scripture there says, When Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. This was early in his ministry. For he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. And so they knew this is not somebody that teaches normally. This is not like the scribes. This is not like the Pharisees. Pharisees. He has great authority in the scriptures. And so you have acknowledged me that I am master. And I am a master in the scriptures, obviously. And then, and Lord, the word there being kurios there, that they acknowledged him as Lord. They called him Lord. And we've seen that in these passages here in John chapter 6. And there in verse 68, you remember there after Jesus had fed the multitudes and then he began to teach them the truth concerning himself and he, they all basically turned away and he turns around and asks the disciples, are you going to go away? And, then it's, and he says, so Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. You see, it makes a difference if you see Jesus as Lord. He is not just a buddy. He is a friend, but he is not just a friend. He is Lord. He is Lord and Savior. Uh, and that was acknowledged by them. And do you remember 
the Apostle Paul, who was Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus, were teaching about the life of Paul in the Sunday school. And when he was struck down the road to Damascus, he said, and we were struck down, and he heard the voice from heaven. He said, what would you have me do? What was his first word there in his address? Lord. He addressed him as Lord. You see, he is Lord over our lives. I hear people use that phrase sometimes. You need to acknowledge his lordship over Well, you need to because he is. Whether you acknowledge it or not, he is your Lord. And the disciples acknowledged the truth concerning Jesus Christ, that he was Lord. He was Lord of the universe and Lord over them. Then we come to verses here, uh, the next verses here. And so in verse 14, If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. And we're going to stop there for just a moment. There are some that have taken this particular passage of Scripture and made it one of the ordinances of the churches. There's, uh, I don't know that there's many of those around, but there used to be uh, denominations that would include this foot washing as an ordinance of the church. Uh, I don't think that it is. I think that it is, it is an example of humility and servanthood, and we're going to talk more about that. But, you know, I don't, uh, I, I, I think it's inappropriate to think of it in a, as an ordinance, but he is giving them an example there. And so he's teaching them that if he, as Lord and Master, Creator, God in the flesh, has acted in humility toward them and washed their feet, then they likewise should act in humility and servitude toward one another. That's the point. You see here, you also, as he said there, do just as I have done to you. Yes, wash their feet. But it goes beyond that. It goes beyond that idea there. This, the example he's giving us is this humility that we are to have toward one another. If he who created all that there was and is the Lord and the master and the teacher and God in the flesh was willing to bow down and wash their feet in an act of servitude and humility and I can't think of anything more humbling than getting down and washing somebody's feet then those that follow him that are his disciples should do likewise. And it's not just talking. I don't think about washing of feet. It talks about a whole lot of other things that we're to do. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 10, the apostle Paul said, Love one another with brotherly affection. What does he say here? Outdo one another in showing honor. We ought to outdo everybody else in showing honor to them and putting ourselves at the bottom rung of the ladder. Now that's the very opposite of human thinking. You should exalt yourself. You say, oh, you should exalt yourself above others. You, the, the natural inclination is to put ourselves at the top of the ladder. But Christ is saying, no, that's the very opposite of where the believer ought to be. We ought to have such love for Christ and love for our brothers and sisters in Christ that we are willing to do whatever it takes to show humility and servitude toward them and as a witness before others and in obedience to Christ. Again, in another place, the Apostle Peter wrote this in 1 Peter chapter 5 in the, in the latter part of verse 5. He says, clothe yourselves, all of you, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. All of you. It does not matter your educational standard. It does not matter your financial standard. It doesn't matter what background that you come from. When we all come into this building, we are all servant. Well, not just in this building. Let me qualify that. All of us, as the fam family of God at Faith Baptist Church, are, should be think of ourselves as servants of the Lord Jesus Christ and servants to one another. And it's one of the things that I, that I talk about when, when people approach me about membership in this body. I say, well, we don't believe in a non-participatory church membership. We believe that we are put here on this earth as believers in the church to serve Christ first and then to serve one another and then to serve 
others even outside the body to spread the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're here for. This is what he's trying to say to the apostles because we already understand they'd had an argument about who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God. Really? <laughs> Honestly? You're calling him Lord and Master and you're arguing about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God? When we get to heaven, there's not going to be any argumentation about that. There's not going to be any exaltation except for the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> he will be exalted. And if you look at the book of Revelation and you see, what do you see in there over and over again? is praise to the Lord Jesus Christ who created all that there was and who shed His blood for our sins. And we're going to sing and we're going to give glory and we're going to give praise for 10,000 years. <laughs> except there won't be any years up there. We won't even know about the passage of time. That is the re that's the purpose. This is why he did this. I am giving you an example of when I am gone. I'm about to be gone. I am giving you this example as how you ought to treat one another and particularly in the church. And we see that mentality in the church because you look in Acts 2 and down through the books of Acts, those first early chapters of Acts, it's talking about them, them selling everything that they have and giving it away so that everyone in that church did not have a physical need. That's humility. That's service. That's giving all for the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we used to sing years ago that song, I surrender all, I surrender all, you know, and we sing it. And it, you know, that's really easy when you come into a church building and you sing, oh, I surrender all. Have you really? Have you really surrendered all? You better be careful about what you sing, too. You know, uh, the scriptures talk about it's better not to make a promise than to make a promise or a vow and not keep it. We better be we care, we better be very careful about the vows and the things that we, we say and sing to the Lord. But maybe the idea of I might surrender all is we surrender lordship over our lives in a sense of the word. Yes, we do, if you're going to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in verses 16 through the end here of the chapter, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who who sent me, sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. See, what are we, the pupil and the disciple, is to do what? He's to emulate, that it's really, mathetes, the, the word there for disciple means to be a follower of that teacher and to do those things that the teacher said. For somebody to say, I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ, means that I have believed not only what he has said doctrinally, but it means I'm going to be submissive to what he has said in a practical sense of the word. Because he says here, if you know these things, blessed are you what? If you do them. Not if you talk about them, but if you do them. We are to do these things that he has commanded. We are to be obedient in the sharing of the gospel. We are to be obedient in the practical outworking of sanctification. We are to be obedient in submitting ourselves to the authority of a church and to be accountable in a church. We're, we're to do those things that he has taught and that are taught in the scriptures. And so he said that you're blessed if you do these things. And then we come on down here and he says here, I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I've chosen. But the scripture will be fulfilled. Who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. He's speaking there about the prophecy in the Psalms concerning Judas Iscariot. He says, I'm telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Did they already, did they did we see here that that he that they had believed in him? Yes. But that that belief. After he resurrected and they saw him ascend to the Father, truly, truly that, that belief in him as the Lord and Savior was deepened. Uh, I, I do believe that. But as again, he say, as he says there, he, he's speaking here of not just, he's not speaking really, he speaks here of the apostles, but he's also speaking of Jesus Iscariot. And so I'm telling you this, before it takes place, it's coming. 
You remember, the the apostles were very sorrowful about Jesus telling them these things. Now, I'm going to tell you this. This is about to come. Be prepared for it. Were they prepared for it? No. They all scattered. They all left him. Peter denied him three times. Peter bragged, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And he says, before the cock crows, you're going to deny me three times, Peter. And Peter even cursed his name the last time of his denial. Sometimes... Humility lessons are hard. Sometimes when we boast of our faithfulness to the Lord, God has to humble us sometimes. I've I've had my share of humble pie in my life as a Christian when God has disciplined me for those. And he knows how to do it. And he says here in verse 19 that when it takes place, you may believe that I am he. That I am he. And what, when, when, when Peter preaches in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, who does he proclaim? The I Am. The Lord Jesus Christ. That's who he proclaims. Peter got it. <laughs> he got it. <laughs> yes, we proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the I Am. He is the Lord. He is the Savior. Believe upon Him. <laughs> That's basically, in a nutshell, you can boil it down to that. Repent of your sins. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the I Am. He did come from the Father. The Father resurrected Him. If you would have eternal life, you must believe upon Him. It was an effective message. The Holy Spirit accompanied it and 3,000 people were saved. So there, He says this, you will, you're going to believe. I say this that you may believe. And he says, truly, truly, again, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. In other words, the apostles, they're Christ's representatives. After Christ leaves, they are the ones that Jesus sends. They are the ones that are in authority over the church. They were to be listened to by the church because they were his representative. They came from him. We see that. There's a particular uh, calling in Ephesians 2 and 20. We see that. But in reality, all of us are proclaimers of the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and the salvation that is in him. Truly, truly, whoever receives the one that I send receives me. That is the question. Do, have men, have you received the word, the one, the ones that God has sent and the message that the Lord Jesus Christ delivered? You see, that's our calling is to continue to deliver the message that the Lord Jesus Christ came here to deliver in the first place as his servants, as servants of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ, as servants of the church, we are to always be about the Father's business of proclaiming the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are continuing the work that he has called us to do. And so that those that receive, those that I have sent, are receiving me. And so that's what we're to do. And it is not, let me say this, it is not just for preachers and teachers of the scriptures. All of us, in some sense of the word, of as believers, are ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians, and there in chapter 5, and there in verse 20, the Apostle Paul makes this pro- proclamation about himself as being an ambassador, but this could be applied to all of us, I believe. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. This is what we are to continue to proclaim. Sinful men, you have offended a holy God You are not reconciled to Him. You are guilty before Him. And so if you would be right with Him, be reconciled to Him through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the blood that He shed upon the cross. And let me tell you something. That was good in that day, and it's still good today. 
And in fact, as the more that the world and the modern day church wants to veer away from that into some social gospel or some works gospel or some health and wealth gospel, let me say this. The focus of the body of Christ is to be that right there. Be reconciled to God through the gospel of the grace of God that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. May we pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gospel today. We thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave us this example of, of servanthood, of humility. And Lord, I would pray that every one in this body would have that mentality that we would clothe ourselves in humility, that we would outdo one another and seek to outdo one another in humility. Father, how many of the problems that churches have in this day would be solved by that. So Father, help us to be obedient to the scriptures. Help us to be obedient to our Lord's example that we find here in John 13. Heavenly Father, make us, if we, need, if we need humility, if we need lessons in humility, then Father, please give them to us that we might be better servants of yours. In your name we pray. Amen.